So this is a fairly reflective talk about really the kind of way I think about, about food and, and the food system and, and how I've tried to bring that to the, the work I've done over the years. So I wanted to start um, really just by showing this diagram, which many of you will have probably seen before, and I show in quite a lot of the talks that I give. Um, because it reflects, it, it depicts for me the food system, which is a lot of stuff that's going on. A lot of processes, a lot of institutions, a lot of people. Um, and quite a, a very complex picture. And, and what's important about it is that it's global and, and I work at the, at the global level. It's a, a global system. And so this leads to a range of, of definitions. Um, you know, it's a web of institutions and people. It's everything that is involved with bringing food to us, all the input, inputs, the ingredients, um, the waste that's involved, and importantly, the interaction between all those different nodes in the system and the interactions with the, the human and the natural environment. There's a lot of stuff going on. So when you think, think of it in those terms, it can seem very remote, something that's very out there something that is not really part of our everyday lives, something that's very distant from us. But I actually think, and I experience, and I think we all experience, in fact, I know we all experience, that the food system is a very everyday part of our lives. I took these photos uh, last summer uh, of my personal food system during um, last summer. And um, they just reflect, I think, that food is, in fact, part of our everyday lives. So at the top, that was my organic bag that arrives every week from a local farmer in the Fens. I, I live in Cambridge. Um, I also have a supermarket delivery that comes regularly. I put food on my plate. That was a breakfast I had one morning. But also, it's not just about the food. It's, I have a dishwasher at home for my sins. I put plates in it. The water is part of the food system. The bins... <coughs> Um, that Cambridge City Council give to me to put my trash in. That's part of our food system. But it's not just the food that we eat in our everyday lives, it's just what we see. You can't go outside of the door here and not start to experience our food system. Indeed, there's probably aspects of the food system in this very room. So in that summer, I went to the, the house that I, uh, where I used to live when I lived in France and spoke to my neighbour, it's in a very deep, remote and rural region, the farmer, and saw his cows, which are used to produce veal for sale in Italy. And I went to the markets there in France and bought my food. I went to Norfolk in nearby Cambridge and saw the sugar beet fields and saw the trucks carrying bioethanol on the road. I saw the fishing boats and the fish shops. And I went to Liverpool to visit my father-in-law and saw the offices of Archer Daniel Midlands, the huge major agribusiness company and the big ships that leave the Liverpool port carrying food from Cargill and other major agribusiness. But of course I also saw the desolated and deprived neighbourhoods of Liverpool where food is not very much part of their everyday lives because there's very little access to food and they're characterised by the boarded up stores. So in experiencing the food system we also begin to experience other people's food systems. So this is really just to reiterate that the food system is very present and very part of our everyday lives. So for me, the connecting thinking in the food system, first of all, starts with us being mindful of our own connections with the food system and understanding that so many of the things that we see around us and the food that we eat is really part of a much bigger system. But it's also about being mindful about how others connect to the food system. It's not just about our own personal experiences, but it's about the fact that other people have very, very different experiences of the food system, and we need to try and understand that. And the third piece of it is connecting, going back to the first diagram, is connecting all the different pieces of the food system together and understanding that it is part of a much bigger, bigger system. And I wanted to show this diagram here. It's just a bunch of lines. But it's a diagram I saw in an academic paper I was reading when I was an uh, undergraduate uh, in geography at the University of Bristol. I don't know quite why I was reading that paper. I can't remember the assignment, but I was reading it for 
a reason. And the reason I wanted to show it is really because I think it encapsulates for me what I mean by um, connected thinking in the system, but in an academic way. It was the first time that I'd realised that this connected thinking that was fairly intuitive, and to be honest, I think it's intuitive to a lot of us, to most people, is actually an academic study. It's a way that we can study things. And this was from um, a geography a textbook, a geographer who, who studied systems and systems thinking. And what struck me about it, more than anything else, is simply that it shows something which I think is a truth, which is that everything is connected to everything else. So that means is that if you're looking at a cause at Q and an effect at D, that you can't get to D without looking at all of these web of interactions between cause and effect. But it means that if you want to find a solution to the effect, if to say that's at D, and you just put into something, something quite superficial, a kind of technical fix happening at D, and you try and move it, then it's going to have some impacts back into the system. But it's going to have the whole system working against it. Unless you change everything in the system underneath it, you have got these superficial solutions which are going to be constantly undermined by what is happening in the system. So that said to me then, back when I was an undergraduate, and something I've tried to take forward in my thinking, is that to find the answers to problems, we need to understand what lies beneath. However, there's some problems with this. If you're going to have a look at these big diagrams and start talking philosophically about what lies beneath and nodes and connections and, and all of this fancy stuff about systems thinking, you can pretty easily get lost. I was at a meeting in November called the Second International Conference on Nutrition, which is a big WHO FAO meeting. And at that meeting, I was in an advocacy role at that, at that point, and I was trying to encourage the people at that meeting to take on board the term food systems. Uh, and, and uh, as a way of addressing nutritional problems. And it's amazing how many people said to me, what's a food system? That was the first point. And the second point was, what's a food system got to do with it? So here we are at a conference talking about what we're eating, and people are telling me what the food system's got to do with it, and I'm like, duh. But, but that, that was a reality. That, that was how people felt, that they didn't understand what a food system had to do with it, because it just seemed too far away from them. And then they said, oh, so tell me the top thing that we need to do in the food system to solve this problem. You know, very kind of reductionist thinking, completely away from the raw food systems type thinking. But you have to sympathise with that, because it's easy to get lost, because there's so much going on. Where do you start? Where do you start when there's so much going on? Um, so there's a, there's a reality here. And, and that makes us go towards that, okay, let's do a technical fix. Let's see, see, do what seems obvious, because doing this food system thing is just too complicated. I mean, I am still in rooms regularly in expert meetings on obesity, where people kind of come up to me quizzically and say, you, you, you kind of do some work on food systems and agriculture, and they say, yeah, that, that, that's something different that you do, is it? I'm like, no, 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 that's part of what I do when I'm working on nutrition and obesity. But I'm sympathetic because it's easy to get lost in such a complex system. But I would argue that it's not so bad to get lost from time to time. We go up blind alleys, we make mistakes, and we find things from it. We allow ourselves to be curious, and I think that's very important. But that said, I do think there's a golden rule, and it's, a, it's, a, it's really kind of important, which I'm a great believer in retrogressive analysis. Connect backwards, work backwards, take the problem that you're trying to solve and work backwards from it into the food system. If you start with the food system, you start with the sun, you know, pretty much, and then you're going outwards from there, and this is too much going on, there's too many problems. Start with the exact problem, the very specific problem that you're trying to solve. That doesn't mean you're ignoring other problems, because you'll find the interconnections between that problems when you start working backwards. But the other part is that you have to connect with the experience of that problem to stay really grounded. 
Otherwise, it all becomes too high for looting and too floaty above the top. So I really want to give some more concrete examples of what I'm talking about here. And in my own work, um, my work on food systems has been focused on what we eat, on healthy eating. The thing that I've been fighting for are ways, food systems and food policy solutions to unhealthy eating, largely in the context of obesity and diet-related non-communicable diseases. I've also done some work on, um, on malnutrition as well, uh, undernutrition, I should say, as well. And so that's been the main problem that I've been trying to focus on. And sometimes I ask myself, why did I focus on unhealthy eating? When I was younger, I wanted to be an environmental activist. I did my PhD in, in, in geography and ecology. And why, did, why didn't I focus on undernutrition? Why was it that I focused on healthy eating? It's because I something I cared about personally. There was a lot of family reasons why I cared about personally. But it's also something that I felt I could experience. I hadn't been an experienced under nutrition. I hadn't done that kind of field work. But I could just go into a local store and I could walk past my neighbour and I could begin to get a sense of why people were eating what they do. And I could ask myself the question, why do I eat, why do I eat what, what I do? And so that personal connection is really very important to me. And it's something that I try and take forward in my work. What we have is, in, when it comes to advocating policies for healthy eating, we have people who have very different perspectives. So you have the people who say it's all about individual preferences. It's all about individual preferences. We need to educate people so that they prefer other foods. Then the other side, you've got people who are advocates of the structural determinants approach. The people who are saying it's all the fault of the industry, it's the fault of food environments, it's the fault of food systems. A very divided situation which is really getting in the way of the implementation of solutions. So I'm giving this as an example because what I try to do here, and this is an infographic put together by The Lancet based on a paper I published in The Lancet Obesity Series um, a couple of months ago. And what I try to do is to situate the individual, because it's the individual who experiences the, the foods that we choose. It's the individual who experiences, but they are contextualized within the broader system. And what I was trying to do is to, is to, is to be honest to both sides and say that both sides have got a point. People do have personal preferences. So people do choose the cake over the apple when you present them with both. They will make the wrong choices. Why is that? Well, that's because they have had a life history. We all have a life history. We're all connected to our past. We've all been surrounded by different food environments. We've had different parents. We've had different caregivers. We've been brought up in different countries. So it's not surprising that we have preference. I tried to reconnect with the biology of it and really found out that these preferences these choices that we make that are driven by preferences are because of our biology, in which we learn preferences. They're not inbuilt. I mean, sure, there's some innate preference for sweetness and things, but mainly it's because we learn them. And so the reason why I make the food choices that I do is because of my life history. And of course, that life history is incredibly influenced by the food environment, by our social environments, by our information environments. So in other words, the environment is incredibly important. That is underpinned by the food system here, but also, I'm an individual, I'm interacting with that because I have developed a series of personal preferences in the past. So it's that trying to, to use biology to look at the relationship between, connect between the past and the present. And that has very important implications for the solutions. Because it means that if governments put into a solution into place, say like a tax, for example, and then people don't respond to it as much as you would like them to do, it's because they've got an strong inbuilt preferences for, for soft drinks. So it's going to take time for that preference to change. So the tax will work, but it will be more effective over time. So the lesson for policymakers, you need to be you need to be patient. It means that things like implementing solutions like marketing to kids are about trying to reduce the in intrusion into the learning of unhealthy preferences. In other words, what I was trying to do is connect the fact that people have a personal experience of food, that they, they'll, they'll make a choice of something over something else, of some food over something else, 
and trying to connect that with the, 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 tech, the context of the bigger food system and the implications for policy. And I'm a great believer that we need to try, as I said, to try and have and understand our own experience and to think about what that means for policy and for solutions to unhealthy eating. And I'm also a great believer that we need to try and understand other people's experiences. On Friday, I was in Cape Town, a rather lovely evening, and I went on a tour of Kalitsa, which is the second largest township. And when I say I went on a tour, I was, I was guided around by a field worker who's working on a pure study. It's a big epidemiological study. So someone who's, who lives in Kailitsa and also is a field worker and he takes people's body measurements and does 24-hour recalls, uh, dietary recalls and so on, uh, as well as, as the legendary David Saunders from University of the Western Cape. And, um, and I wanted to see what the food environment was like, which I'd, I'd read about but, but not seen. And it was incredibly interesting, um, and I took this, this photo of these delightful women um, selling um, incredibly fatty meats, which you can see there, which are kind of a nice treat that people can have when they go home from work, if they can maybe once a week, or if they're a bit wealthier, they can have it every day. But it's a, more, of a, more of a treat. Um, and of course, you can see the Coca-Cola signs, and here is one of the local shopping malls with a ShopRite, which is a South African supermarket, but a huge... Um, dynamite of a supermarket throughout um, so southern and east Africa as well as, as KFC. Um, really not a great food environment, really not a great food environment. I would say there was 100% obesity among the women there and the children were stunted. Um, they were malnourished as well as some of them being very overweight. So really, really not a good situation at all. And I went into the supermarkets and uh, saw some really uh, foods that really kind of made my skin crawl. Uh, so, so this is uh, what's called polony, um, and it's this kind of um, sausage plastic thing with a kind of sausage in, um, and um, it's very, very cheap. This is a ShopRite brand, so it's the cheapest, and then this is actually another brand, but you can see the ingredients a bit clearer. Well, you can see it's made from mechanically um, deboned meat mainly, plus water, plus a small amount of meat. And some of it didn't have any meat in at all, in fact, plus a load of fillers and, and spices and, and, um, and pretty awful um, preservatives. So my reaction to that was, this is kind of gross, you know, we need to kind of get rid of this stuff. It's kind of horrible. Um, and uh, so that was my kind of initial, uh, initial reaction. I went back to my hotel room to do a bit of research onto it into it because I was like, why, why is this stuff in, in this stores? You know, what, what, what's going on? Why is it there? And I was really trying to connect what I'd seen in this very local environment with the whole global food supply. What has this, very, this food, which is widely consumed by local people as a cheap uh, protein, um, got to do with the global system? Is there something going on there? rather than just thinking as, you know, they like it. Sure, they like it, they've come to like it, but what are the forces behind the fact it's been put into their environment and then they have learned to have a preference for, uh, for it. So I first looked at the global dimension. This is just done a little bit of research in my hotel room. Um, but, but really I found out that all of this mechanically deboned meat is imported into South Africa, largely from Brazil. And Brazil has developed a powerhouse of an industrial chicken industry, which has now taken over from the United States, with all the environmental implications, all the antibiotic use, all the things that are pretty unpleasant about industrial chicken production. And Brazil is an industrial powerhouse, uh, agricultural powerhouse, and exports a lot of this elsewhere, including MDM to South Africa and into other countries. <coughs> Um, there is a chicken industry in South Africa as well, but for some reason that I don't know why, um, it's not worth them making MDM. They can make more profits by selling the, the, the meat on the bone uh, rather than slowing it off um, and putting it into a sieve. So you can see that um, imports um, into South Africa have increased. And so, again, my reaction was like, let's just ban trade of this stuff. You know, this is just dumping. You know, this is just, just horrendous. But then I stopped to think, hang on a minute. We can put the local environment in the context of the global environment, but we have to come local again and think, well, people have come to like it, they've learned to like this stuff, but it's not just because they've learned to like it, because they're constrained. These are very, very 
very poor people. And if you think about it, this pollinate stuff is actually a cheap source of protein. One of the few sources of protein they can actually afford. The poorest people in Kalitsa can afford meat once a week, like proper fresh meat or frozen meat once a week. The poorest people have two meals a day, and they may have a tiny bit of meat once a week. But they can have pollen most days of the week. So who am I to start saying, let's ban this, let's get rid of this? It doesn't seem right to me. And also, it's valuable and important to the local food processing industry. This stuff is made in South Africa. They get the slurry on the boat or however it comes in. And then it's the local food processing industry employing local people to make this and employing people and creating jobs. Now, this is where you get lost. What do you do? What do you do about this situation? Very, very difficult. But I think it stimulates the asking of questions. And these are the questions that I asked myself that evening after I'd had that tour in my hotel room. I was thinking about the inequality of the animal. The slurry goes to the poor. The chicken breasts go to the wealthy. And that mirrors the inequality of income. Why is it that we need to have a food system where poor people are fed the waste? Ideally, if they're going to have a healthier source of protein, it would be the whole chicken. Now, at one point in my tour, we went past some women selling whole chickens. And my guide said, these are good chickens. He said, these are great chickens. These are a delicacy. People can't really afford these. There was about, each woman had about 10. So that means about 20 people that day from a township of a million people could afford to buy a whole chicken. But what do local populations need to afford whole chickens? Well, it just comes down to the society. They need investment in education. They need to know how to raise those chickens. They need to have access to land to raise those chickens. They need to have jobs. They need to have education. So that means that a lot of the answer lies in the whole investment in infrastructure and investment in people and in societies. The other question I ask myself is, how can a local processing industry be established that is going to benefit the whole chicken industry. And we need to think about that economic dimension because otherwise if you start talking about banning things, um, the opponents that you get are from the local industry as well as the multinational industry. And you have to think why and try and understand their experience about why they may be opposing these restrictions. Because so often when we talk about healthy eating, we're talking about bans and restrictions and what not to do. And we have to start thinking about investing in alternatives and investing in viable alternatives for people who don't have enough. The next example I wanted to give was from Marketing to Kids. I've worked on Marketing to Kids for, for many, many years now. And I started my work on Marketing to Children when I was asked by the World Health Organization to uh, prepare a report on the marketing activities, which Patty reviewed, I remember now. Um, <laughs> Uh, you'll remember it, I hope. Um, and uh, uh, I was asked by the World Health Organization because they were developing something called the Global Strategy on Diet, Physical Activity and Health, and they wanted to know if they, they had legitimacy to include food marketing to kids in that strategy. So they asked me to do a review of the evidence of what Coke, McDonald's, etc., were doing to market um, their food to kids in lower middle income countries. And um, and all of this stuff that I, I, I spent my time, I was living in New York City at the time, and I spent my time in the basement of, of New York University Library, trawling through annual reports, trawling through uh, newspaper reports, the trade press, the small print, um, I, and trying to find out what these companies were actually doing. And it wasn't pleasant reading. It, it really wasn't. I, in those days, I printed everything out, and I still have it, which is just as well, because when I went back and checked it a few years ago to see if it was still there, I found that Coke had taken everything off. Um, uh, that I, none of this is publicly accessible anymore, all the stuff that I found. Um, and, um, and so anyway, so fortunately, I did keep it, and I still have it, and I do have a little bit in my, in my house. And I took it, this is a photo that I took 
uh, yesterday, um, which is talking about Tika is a, a part of Panamco, which is a bottler in, in, in Latin America, about their school plan. And you can read it here. I don't need to read it out. But you can see that the bottler had this, it was part of the 100 metres program, where they were going to make sure that Coca-Cola was with 100 metres of everybody at all times in their lives, including at schools. And so you can, you, the project entailed a, detail, uh, entailed a number of initiatives, including creating new points of sale, appropriate products and packaging, and then showing off in this annual report that we boosted sales volumes in Costa Rican schools by 50%. That was in, in less than a year. So I was, I was reading this stuff, and I, I didn't like, like, much like what I saw. So this is some other quotes that I, I, I saw in, in the literature. Uh, the philosophy is if you get them in grade school, if it happens from their 90, uh, building fra franchises with kids now, focusing on working our way into the skin of younger people, penetrating the teen psyche. You know, I was horrified. I was like, nanny industry, come on, let, you know, let's not talk nanny state here, let's talk nanny industry. We, we've just got to get rid of this, we've got to ban it. And I, I, I remain an advocate of, of banning and I have, I have been active um, for, for, for years in, in supporting restrictions on food marketing to children. A lot of it through analysis, analysing what policies are going to be the most effective. And I was the chair of expert group at WHO and various things. And I have to say, um, as I was telling someone earlier, I think it's, I've been a spectacular failure. And I think all of us who've worked in this area have been spectacular failures. Uh, in part of my work at World Council Research Fund International, I uh, reported on the, got together the information about what policies have been putting into place on food marketing to kids and other policy areas as part of the nourishing framework. And uh, I think we have three countries who've taken, um, who've actually put into place restrictions uh, of any type, and none of them are particularly good, and the best is the UK. I, I don't call that a sign of success. I think we need to think about our tactics a little bit again. But I've been thinking for a while that we haven't been very successful. And I thought, what can we learn from understanding the upstream drivers of this? Are these people in these companies doing this marketing really evil? <laughs> I, Patty may disagree with me, but I don't think they are. I think they're regular folk doing a job according to a set of incentives. What incentives do they have? Why is it that they're going to make so much money out of marketing to kids? And I had the opportunity to look into this more closely in a piece of work I did for the Robert Johnson um, Foundation Healthy Eating Research Program a few years ago. And I, I just excuse the, the poor quality of the slide there. But what I wanted to say is, is what is going on beneath and so uh, I looked at, you know, started, worked backwards, just like I did in my hotel room in South Africa, working backwards. But this was more formally and more analytical, going backwards, and I mapped out the food supply chain. And I looked at various incentives in the food supply chain, the power relations, the financial incentives, the organisational incentives, uh, the technological incentives, the policy incentives, to try and understand why on earth it was that Coca-Cola in particular had such an aggressive marketing machine in schools as well as in advertising. And wow, what a great study on power relations that was. What I've put down here is the numbers of, of, of the millions of, there's one Coca-Cola company and there's millions of schools, but the power is in the Coca-Cola company. There's only about three main players globally on soft drinks. Then they're connected with their bottlers, and then they go into retails, retailers and then people buy them. So what I discovered is, is Coca-Cola doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. It's a brand. And it has the concentrate. It has the concentrate, the stuff that goes into Coca-Cola. It doesn't actually do anything. The bottlers are the ones that do the work. They're the ones that bottle the concentrate, add the water and distribute it. So they bear a lot more costs. Then the Coca-Cola company who essentially don't do anything but own the brand and the recipe. And the recipe. So the bottlers can't do anything without Coca-Cola. But the Coca-Cola don't have anything to spend their money on because they don't do anything. So their profit margins are unheard of, 69%, these kinds of things. 
So they're sitting there thinking, what do we do with this money? We can spend it on advertising. We can spend it on advertising. And that's why they have so much money to spend on advertising. But then when you go down to the retailers, you have there's even less power among the retailers. But retailers like Walmart and McDonald's do have some power over bottlers because they can have exclusive contracts and there's relatively few of them. Um, but the people who are really at the bottom of the pile are the millions of, you can't see that, this is kind of like a, a, a bodega, a spaza store, the little stores, and the millions and millions and millions of schools around the world. They have no power at all. There's, there's lots of them, um, but they have no power, and they're being offered money by the Coca-Cola company, but they have no power in negotiating contracts. So the school thinks that they're getting a lot if they just take a little bit of the money for the rental space of the vending machine. But they are completely naive. You know, if most property owners where products are sold take a much larger margin than the school. So they take very little, if any, of the product price. The product pri uh, price in schools um, is higher than supermarkets because kids, people are prepared to pay for convenience. That's on the demand side. Um, but schools are in a very weak position to bargain um, the the bottlers down on price because there's so many of them. So you've got individual schools negotiating with a much more powerful bottler and therefore they don't feel they've got much power. They, the bottler comes, this is how much it costs and, and, the, and, the, and the schools are saying, okay, you know, as long as we're getting a little bit of a cut, we're fine. And these schools aren't consolidating. You don't get consolidation among schools. Um, so that doesn't threaten the profits of the industry. So the main cost of the bottler is distributing the product and maintaining the vending machines in schools but they can charge you know, a pretty high margin. The school doesn't take very much. So this means, put together, um, that even though soft drink scales in schools tend to be very small, uh, relatively small, um, it's not 15% isn't tiny, and, but some, some uh, you'll hear them say it's only 2 to 3%, they represent a very large proportion of the profits because of the structure of power um, in the chain. So that leads you to start thinking, OK, so what can we do? Perhaps we can encourage, you know, what are the strategies that we can think of? What are the advocacy strategies? What are the active strategies we can do to try and get schools um, to counter this power relation? I won't go on in detail, but there's a whole load of policy and regulations that govern competition. The Intra-Brand Competition Act, for example, in, in the United States is very, very important. Um, there's a whole load of rules that cover competition in the food industry. We need to be working much harder to look at those competitive structures to stop these uneven power relations. Um, but we can also do things like encourage schools to collectively bargain with the bottlers so they can get a much, much better deal and start saying we're only going to have your vending machines if it's just water or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of understanding of power relations and financial relationships upward in the supply chain can help us understand why they have so much incentive to market to kids, so much incentive to get their stuff into schools, but also begin to help us identify some strategies of tackling it. <coughs> so I just want to end then with some, um, some lessons that I've learned um, through. I, just, I had many more examples at one point. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to give a couple of examples. Um, but I want to give some lessons learned through the examples I've given, but also through my broader experiences as well. One of which I should add is an example I didn't include, was that I spent a year in Brazil, um, and I studied the school meal program there, and that had a very um, important influence on my thinking in a, in a very positive way, because I think what happened in Brazil was, was very positive. So these are the... What I, the, the mindset that I aspire to have... In, in the work that I'm, I'm taking, um, in the work that I do. And the first one I'd like to highlight is about making the personal the political. And it's about bringing our own experiences to bear on all of it, for all of us who work in the food system. And without wanting to sound too critical, I think there's too much of our own personal preferences that go into the solutions that we offer. So there's some people out there who I think are fantastic, who are very strong advocates of farmers' markets, for example. I, I am too. I, I am too. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't deny that. But that, for them, is their solution. 
There are some people who say that the answer is that we have to go back to traditional diets, get rid of ultra-processed foods, eat whole foods. And we think, yeah, I, you know, I don't disagree with that either. But when you actually look at the background of those people, you're finding out they're advocating what they, the food that they like to eat themselves. I always think there's two types of people in the food world. There's the foodies and the non-foodies. And the foodies, of which I count myself as one in that sense, love food. They love spending their weekends hanging around at markets. They love planting plate potatoes just before Easter. You know, the, 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 they love food. And their solutions tend to be much more around connecting with food, farmers' markets, the kind of food that they like to eat. And then there were the non-foodies, which I first encountered when I started to work at the World Health Organization, who talk about product reformulation. And, and then when you go and see what their personal preference is, they don't like hanging around at markets at weekends. They don't have, they don't have a garden. You know, it's, it's a, they're a different type of people. And, um, but they have an experience of trying to get the best that they can from the market. For those, so for them, product reformulation is great because they'll get a little bit less fat, salt and sugar or whatever. And so people, because food is something that we experience in our everyday lives, because the food system is so real to us, we tend to over-personalise it and put our own personal preferences into the solutions. I think that what we need to do is to work much harder to put ourselves into other people's shoes and try to understand why those people in that South African township are eating what I think is a pretty horrible food. Why is it that people make the food choices that do? Try to put ourselves through the experience, through other people's eyes and look at it from other people's experiences so that we don't get bogged down and biased in our own solutions, our own personal solutions, but really trying to understand it through the eyes of others. And to do that, we need to get out there. Our criticism I have of myself and my own work, particularly in recent years, is that it has been inadequately connected to people's lives and people's lives in communities, and that's something that I'm, I'm hoping to change in the future. But I do try and do my best by whatever country I go to, I always try and go into the local market, the local supermarket, to do a tour, to try and feel what it feels like to be someone else in that food system. And the other point I'd like to make is a reflection on, again, coming out of the solutions that we propose. I said earlier that you tend to get the education people, the, like, it's all personal preferences people, and then the people who are talking about food systems and structural determinants and public health. And a lot of people get on their hobby horse and they say, this is the right solution. Um, you know, the, or this is, the, this is the cause of the problem, I should say. The problem is the food industry. The problem is ultra-processed foods. The problem is X. The problem is Y. And then you get the other people shouting about, the problem is that people are just stupid and making the wrong choices. The problem is that people are this. You know, you get these big arguments that go on and you get that around solutions. Constant battles. The tax is right. No marketing to kids is right. No education is right. No, let's have labelling on foods. When you actually look at all of those solutions, when you actually think in the systems framework, you find an element in truth in all of those solutions. Pretty much all of them, you can find an element of truth. But what we tend to do is, we tend to, to, to get on our, our hobby horse, to defend ourselves and fight for the solution that we believe to be the absolute right solution, and say, this is what I know. We put ourselves in our expert groups. I'm now on various expert groups, and I'm beginning to get slightly embarrassed. This is the sort of thing that when I was a young guy, I used to aspire to, and now I'm on these expert groups. I'm just kind of, you know, what does an expert really mean? Are we really an expert? Or are the people who experience the problem the experts? You know, what, what, does that, what does that mean? Who am I to stand up and say, this is the solution? Um, but I'm not arguing, we don't argue in solutions. I'm arguing that we need to put it all together. And the real challenge that we have, those of us who work on food systems, is in putting it together. And it's only by putting it all together that we're really going to start to identify solutions. But then we need to have courage and make a choice. We need to strategize then, once we've put it all together, where, it is, where, it is, that we fo where, where is it that we focus? And it shouldn't be necessarily on our own turf. It may be about engaging with others on someone else's turf. 
and really make a judgment about how best to act. And that's a really challenging thing to do. And I would say that, that having the courage to strategize and make a judgment is why I'm reflecting a lot at the moment. Because I certainly don't think I've got the answer. I don't think I've done well enough. I think I have got a lot more to do. And it's a th something I'm thinking through at the moment about what to do. You know, what do we really need to do? And I think all of us should always be asking ourselves that and challenging ourselves uh, in order to, to make these difficult decisions about how we make change in, a, in what is a very complex, a very, both very complex, but also a very tangible system. I think that's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Luke Craven from the University of Sydney. I've actually got two questions, if you'll permit me those. <laughs> I'm here for uh, other stuff, but <laughs> couldn't, couldn't stay away. Um, <laughs> first thing I'd like to do, Corinna, great talk, uh, is, is challenge you on something you said very early on, um, which is that systems thinking is intuitive. Um, and then your own experiences in expert groups seems to just suggest that perhaps your experience jars with that a little bit, but there is sort of some really interesting experimental psychology work out um, from organisational psychology scholars that says actually we're very bad at thinking in causal webs. Um, particularly English speaking people tend to be awful at it, at generative causality, because mm -hmm. we, we speak in a language where it's object, verb, referent. Um, so I wonder if, if systems thinking isn't actually intuitive and that's part of the problem not only in the way that the public perceives the issue, but that policymakers do. Um, and so then the second thing uh, is around. Do with that first or you have to wait for both? I'll, I'll wait for both, that's okay. Um, is around this concept of the importance of experience when thinking about systems. And I really liked your paper in The Lancet, and I think it's probably one of the first times I've seen a, a system that is person centred, right? So that actually puts a person in the centre. But some of those other systemic diagrams, like the one that you showed first, or the the famous one from the Foresight Report about mm -hmm. obesity, which is hugely messy and you really aren't sure where the person is. The problem then is when we think about solutions, the person does get lost. And I wonder if you think that we should be pushing for more person-centred systems, mm -hmm. more generally. Thank you. Thank you. Both very good questions. Yeah, let me clarify what I meant by that. I don't think people know necessarily um, that they are part of a system. I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say systems thinking is, in, I, I wouldn't say systems thinking is intuitive. I would say that in our lives, our, our lives are systems, and, and our lives are acted out in a systems way, but we don't necessarily know it, and we don't necessarily realise it. Um, uh, that's kind of what I was saying, but I was also saying something about myself, which is that I suppose I was thinking about connected thinking from, you know, I was that kind of person who read those books when I was 17 and, and you know kind of got into it a uh, fairly uh, young age I guess so so I think I don't know whether I'd say it was intuitive whether I'd learned it uh, I think I think it's a good point by that point it was it was something that I felt intuitively and then it was consolidated for me personally but I do think that people's lives are connected and the way that we live our lives are connected and then it, we try to put things into boxes all the time and to put walls around things and that actually isn't how, how people's lives play out. Um, I hope that is a sufficient answer. The, the second point is absolutely, I, part of what I was trying to do in that Lancet paper was to try and make systems more people-centred. I often talk about people-centred policy. And, and part of the reason for that is because I hate this dichotomy between this, you're either an individual or you're part of a system. Well, it's to me an individual as part of the system. And, and that we seem to be fearful of talking about persons, people's personal preferences, as if, you know, you know, people don't have preferences, they're forced to eat it. Um, whereas, in fact, it's more of a gradual process of learning. Um, so I think we should absolutely be talking about people-centred um, systems um, to stay grounded and to stay, you know, to keep people's, to remind people and to allow people a voice to say that their personal experience is, is valuable uh, and it is part of, of our systems thinking. So I, I would agree completely. Eileen O'Keefe, <coughs> London Metropolitan. Um, slightly complicated question. Over the last couple of weeks, we've had The Guardian promoting disinvestment. 
uh, in fossil fuel companies by Welcome and um, the Gates Foundation. How nice. <laughs> now, the Gates Foundation and the Gates Foundation and um, the Gates Foundation and Welcome are also involved in the develop have been involved in the development of an audit tool looking at the 25 biggest food companies in the world and looking at the nutritional qualities of and and so on uh, of those companies and I think and you know they've gone through now the second iteration of, of, of the process now given the fact that also it has been identified that the, the Gates Foundation is the biggest owner of Coca-Cola shares, um, according to the work that has been done by McKee and Stuckler. Um, what are the opportunities available to us, given the fact that Welcome and the, and the Foundation presumably are trying to do something useful and so on in relation to the audit tool, to therefore say, okay, can we press you to be consistent in relation to your own, own holdings in these companies? That's a little question for you. <laughs> while, while you're thinking, for those who don't know, and the film will be shortly up, I don't know if it is, Nadia, we held an ESRC seminar on food and corporations, which you can come to, which um, Patty Rundle in the back here spoke at, that was a very nice summary talks about exactly this problem in Eileen's question. Yeah, it's so online. It's already online. online, so it's on the Food Research Collaboration website, the ESRC seminar series. Corinne. Yeah, well, that, that's quite a tough question. I, I had I had thought I'd read that Gates had divested itself um, of uh, the food industry, but maybe I was some okay. Um, but but that's just that's just my most re uh, recent reading. Obviously, that's irrelevant because your your point is is that they they have made those those investments. Yeah, I mean it's it's quite a tricky one to to, to address. Um, I mean, I guess your question is really asking. Um, I mean, are, are you are you saying that they're, they're biased in the index of accountability? Yeah, all that I'm saying is they are one of the... Oh, one one of moment, the they have a location within the power structure in so far as they own shares. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that questions are being raised about fossil fuel um, right, activities. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, is this part of what should be yeah. an element within the advocacy process? Yeah. No, That's I think the accountability processes from the investment community could be a lot more than they are now. Um, I think there is um, inv uh, investors and the investment community do do some accountability issues around fossil fuels and, and elsewhere, but I, certainly in the whole kind of obesity space, I think uh, shareholders and investors. Uh, should be kicking up a hugely bigger fuss around obesity in particular um, and asking questions about what are they doing just in their own workplaces to make sure that their own workers are healthy and what incentives they've got and what programs they've got uh, at that basic level and then asking them questions about what they're doing and I, I, I think it's a really good point that that is a, a, a source of potentially very strong accountability um, from Gates or from Welcome or whoever the investors are um, to, to hold those companies more accountable. I absolutely ag agree that that's a, um, a good thing to do. Hi, Corinna. Is that, no, is that on? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I'm Patty Rundle uh, from Baby Milk Action Ipfan, and we've been friends a long time, for you, uh, Corinna. So I've been really, really interested in, in that talk. But I'm I am now really confused about where you are in all this, and that's right. You've said at the end, where are we? We're in reflective. I feel that. I feel really in a reflective mode myself all the time. We've been 35 years trying to bring in controls and regulations on the baby food industry, and that's the first system. The food system is the, the breast milk is the first system that we've been trying to protect, and it's, it's fast going to disappear if we don't really do something. So I, I am just intrigued. You, you made several references to me during the talk as, as if I think the people who work for corporations are evil people. 
And I just wanted to get that on the record. This is nonsense. This is absolutely nonsense. Everybody I was, I is human. I was teasing you. Patty. I know you're I was teasing, teasing me. Anna. But, but it's a very, very important point that it, you, and you're missing the corporate, that, that thing about uh, Pepsi and, or Coca Cola, the ones at the top. Are we saying that we should go together with the ones right at the top and discuss with them how best we manage this whole? problem of food systems, inequality, everything else, you know, the awful, awful inequality that is caused by the huge corporations. Do we go to the Bill Gates Foundation, and welcome sitting here beside me, who are highly invested in, I, I mean, I don't know so much about the, the um, welcome, but from Gates, from our perspective, working in infant and young child feeding, it is terrifying what's happening now that we, the bait gate is completely taking over everything that's happening at WHO on breastfeeding or on infant feeding. It is everywhere. Ev the meeting I'll go to next week, gates everywhere. So what's the question? The question is, how are we going to, you, you know, you and I are involved in this conflict of interest coalition that started that is saying keep corporations or commercial influence away from policy setting keep our policy setting free from commercial influence. Is that something now that you no longer think is feasible, wise, or anything? Or is it something that could, because from my perspective, we need really good people who are look, governments looking <laughs> at what the, the rights of the people are. Let me answer. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think anything I said suggested that we should um, um, go and, and work, uh, work at the top. Um, and certainly nothing I said suggested that um, corporations should be involved in policy setting. Um, so I'm not quite sure what confused you. But, but, but I, I think what is um, really important um, is that we understand why they are doing what they are doing. Now, that was my only point. Yeah, that's what I understood. Um, and, and, yeah. and, and doing that understanding might involve some conversations. It might, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, and I think, in fact, I would actually argue more than that. I'd actually say we have a responsibility to uh, try and understand why they're doing what they're I doing. Think you're going further. Sorry uh, to interrupt. Can I yell at you? Because yeah. it goes on to mind. I thought what Corinna was arguing was we've, since the strategies are failing, and Patty, you were saying this. Can you hear? Uh, since the, I'm going to yell at you. Not all the mind? strategies are failing, some. Okay. Yeah. Corinna was rightly saying what many of us think on lots of fronts in public health and environment, climate <coughs> change, water, land use, not good, you know? Not good. You're absolutely right. In which case we've got to take stock and say why. Yeah. And therefore say, well, what would make it good, is what I understood you asking. And I think that's right. And you secondly said, no one thing will make a difference. It's going to be multiple. Yeah. Again, that's absolutely right. It's ecological thinking. You know, that's what Jeff and I argue. I think you're absolutely right. And my answer to Patty, but go on, you give my answer. <laughs> oh, well, I have answered. I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't making, I didn't make any particular point about that in, 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 in my talk about whether they should be involved in policy development or, or whatever. Um, I, what, what I think, though, that we need to look at how our economies have changed. When I was born in the early 1970s, the economy, the way that economies were managed were completely different to what they are now. And very, during my lifetime, in the last um, however many years, um, the, the economies have, 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 have completely changed. And there was much more state management. There was support for state management. And we've shifted to a very different model of, of, of more free market economies, in inverted commas. Uh, it's meant to be more consumer-led, consumption-led. And um, there are certain advantages for that, and there's been quite a lot of disadvantages of that. And one of the issues that has happened is, is that how you govern the private sector, given that economics and politics have become intertwined 
is, a, a, is an issue that has simply not been addressed at the global level, at the regional level, at the national level, and at the local level. We simply haven't understood that how to govern the relationship between the public and the private. And in fact, it's difficult to differentiate between the private. Almost saying public and private doesn't mean what it did in the 1970s. So when you look at the governance of the food system, it has... It, it hasn't caught up. It was like we had this great idea about globalisation and economic theory. It was actually kind of a good idea in some ways, but implemented so naively without really taking to understand how, what that means for governance, political governance, economic governance, and the consequences. So, so, so the, the problems that you work on on an everyday and, uh, level are part of this bigger picture about bigger political and economic change. And that's why I'm reluctant to, to, to sort of say that the only problem is the corporations. I believe that, I'm not saying that you are saying that, but I, I, I didn't say that, I didn't make that point, because it's part of a broader political economic, I didn't talk about the political economic system, but the food system is, is part of that. And, and we really have got ourselves into a bit of a mess over it. Um, and, um, and so that governance piece is, is critical. And to be honest, I've never met anyone who really knows what to do with it. Yeah, I agree. Let's go. We've got a, a long queue, which is good, but that's a, a great point being brought up. Uh, Chris Brooks from the UK Health Forum. It's very hard to enter into a discussion of that kind. That's a really great discussion. And I really welcome the fact that you're both being reflective and a bit critical. I'd, I'd say you may, maybe being a bit overcritical. I think you have achieved <coughs> a loss between those who are advocating for you know, better food systems, ways of tackling obesity, and so on. Uh, at, you know, the beginnings of a discussion around whole systems approaches to addressing obesity and the obesogenic environment. That's starting to be some of the mainstream conversation that people like Public Health England are having. So it's you know maybe maybe we'd say. It's still too small what they mean by whole system approach, but nonetheless, it's happening. It's starting to happen. One of the things I keep on thinking about for various different reasons is whether we have the skills within public health that we need. Because what you're actually saying, I thought several times, was we need to effectively do reverse marketing. So what's it like? What's the consumer groups like? What are the drivers that get people to eat particular foods or have, we have particular markets to so understanding more about kind of the food systems and the marketing is really important and we need, therefore need to spend more time as public health people understanding that. So that's, that's the question. Do you agree that we need to do more work in terms of mapping the marketing of food systems? Yeah, I am... Um First of all, thanks for making that point about, about the fact that progress has been made. It, it has. I was just saying earlier that I, I engage quite a lot with the undernutrition space. And, and uh, when I first started to do that in um, 15 years ago or so, um, I was kind of a pariah. Uh, and I, I've just taken on a, a position um, welcomed by everybody with, a, oh, great, uh, by uh, uh, people... Um, dominated by the undernutrition community great we wanted someone who has expertise in obesity and diet related chronic diseases so that in 15 years has been a complete switch um so there have been these 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 important things that have moved forward so i thanks for pointing that out um i think what we need is to understand need-based food markets for me i i was i did have a slide on this and i took it out for, for length but but i think the fundamental problem is that our food markets are a mess and, and that we haven't got food markets that serve people's needs. Um, and one of the, the reasons for, neo, for neoclassical economic theory was, was to reorient food markets towards people's needs, which is one of the positive things about, about that theory, away from being producer-driven um, producer needs, uh, which introduces a whole load of other problems, but I won't go there. But, but um, the fundamental problem with food policy is how... To have to serve the producer needs and the consumer needs and the needs of the of the actors all the way along the food it is probably the fundamental problem of food policy, in my view, um, and, um, and but we need to we need to start thinking of, or you know continue to think about how we can have food markets and start and say what what do people need, not just what they want but what do they need from a health perspective. 
because the economic neoclassical model has been, let's focus on what people want. And as if we are born with what... So the economic theory um, believes in exogenous preferences, to use the lingo, that they believe that you're born with a set of preferences that you then go and express. They haven't read the behavioural psychology literature that says, no, we actually learn our preferences over time. Um, and so that makes them very comfortable with the language of want. Um, whereas I think we need to be talking about needs from a health perspective, remembering, of course, that healthy diets can be delicious. You know, there's nothing inconsistent about a healthy diet and a delicious diet and, and taste preferences. Um, and so I think to a certain extent we need to take on the economics profession um, or the, 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 uh, and their understanding of the way that markets operate. Um, and, and we need to have consumer groups and civil society talking about the foods that really people need in their communities and to stay grounded and to be people-centred in that way. and work back yeah. in a retrogressive way as one way of tackling some of the issues you saw. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I absolutely I think that's part of what we need to be doing. Thinking of a scenario, yeah. what would be ideal? Um, and then we're working backwards from that. I, I, I moved into a house in, in Cambridge recently and did something that I hadn't done before, which is to move into a new development. Um, so I, and I thought my, my husband works in, in urban theory and, and we thought it would be interesting, in fact Tim's visited it, thought it would be um, interesting to see what it's like to live in a new, a new community that's been growing and there's building sites everywhere and things. And, uh, and it's just, I mean apart from realising about power relations for property developers, um, uh, you sort of realise, you know, they really messed up in certain places, they really did. Um, they didn't put all kind of walkability things, but one of the major things they didn't think of is, is, um, is retailing. So I get constantly frustrated because I, and I like to, to eat a lot of fruit and give my daughter lots of fruit to eat, I'm always running short of fruit in the house because there isn't anywhere that you can just get fruit in the local community. There was like, everyone can just go to Waitrose. Uh, rather than actually thinking, what are the needs of these people in this growing community, which is going to have 2,000 people living in it, in it from zero in, in two years with AstraZeneca, who biomedical facilities growing up. I mean, it's just, uh, it's going to be more than 2,000 people, I should say. Um, or like five so um, and they, they just didn't think about what people would need for their food needs it's just absent and I think that's a good example they should have had a scenario workshop saying what will people need and then work back from there so. Thank you. Um, my name's Sharon Noonan Gunning. I'm a, a children's dietitian in Islington and I'm doing a PhD here with Tim in food policy. Um, and I'm just at the stage of my PhD where I'm sort of putting together the, some of the interviews I've done with, with parents, predominantly working class parents of children with obesity. Um, it's a policy analysis. I've done interviews with local policy makers, but I've also done work to parents. It's qualitative work and um, I've spoken to parents on benefits, bus drivers, women bus drivers, male bus drivers, a range of parents mainly you know, living in, who are working or not working but living in deprived areas and a lot of sort of what you're saying is sort of, sort of marries to what some of the parents have been saying as well that when you talk about governance and governance of food then one word that's come up over and over is that one the parents do, a number of parents I used cards in interviewing the parents. A number of parents placed cards about the food company, supermarkets and others. And they said they're all interlinked, they're all interlinked. Um, and they use the words when they're talking about the foods that they feed their children and the choices that they have. And they use the word over and over. Many parents use the word allow, that governments and councils allow. Um, they don't blame the food companies. The parents, a lot of the parents were saying that you know, they're a business, they've got to make money, but it's the government and it's the, it's the councils that allow 
um, them to come in and, satur and basically saturate the communities with unhealthy foods. And then they would talk about the fast foods and the local foodscape and how the local retail shops aren't there anymore, and that they don't want to go to the supermarkets where you've got no real choice. You just, you're, you're, you're blinded of stimuli all over, but they want the local shops and markets and things like cutting out the middlemen. There was a whole number of different phrases that were used that sort of came up, you know, that was similar to what you were saying. Um, and also, in terms of asking them, um, uh, you know, whether they should be involved in making policy, um, I spoke to 18 parents, and all, all of them said yes. They all said that um, that they're the ones who've got the influence over their over the kids, and so the government should be talking to them. And the ways in which they saw the government talking to them was things through like community work at community level. That it's got to be through the old shore starts. It's got to be through schools. It's got to be at that level. And and and, and then when I asked them what the, what would they do if they're a prime minister then um, you know, the sort of things that parents were, were, were talking about was about, um, uh, you know, again, the sort of more you know, control over the, over, over the, lo over the local, local, um, um, local shops and more sort of peer, more sort of peer support. Of, um, but it's, but the, re the real issue for me that's coming out of it is about democracy at the local level. And, that, and that's what was coming through as well, is that the... It's the lack of democracy and that parents felt that they haven't really got any control over their local foodscape, over what they feed their kids, because in the end, as the word affordability kept coming up as well. It's all about affordability. Um, so it's really just, I suppose, what I'm sort of getting to is the question of democracy and how, um, you know, there, there is a big governance questions, but, you know, it all, but, but, but the, the involving building sort of democ democratic traditions from the bottom and involving people who count and how we can begin to do that so that then they have a greater voice, a greater control over what begins to happen. So I've just sort of thrown a few things there and I just, I suppose really on the issue of democracy and what your thoughts are on that. Wow, well, thanks so much for sharing that with us. I have to say, I wish I'd been a fly on the wall at those interviews. I would have learned a lot. And thanks so much for sharing that, that with me and, and, and us here. Uh, fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, it's so interesting when you hear, allow people a voice. And, and it just makes me think when I'm in my rooms talking about food taxes or whatever, much as I'm a supporter of, of soda taxes and so on, that you, know, you can't just talk about this stuff. You have to talk about what people are feeling um, at the, and experiencing at the, at the local and community level. It comes back to the sort of person-centered food systems. And it's funny, when I was in South Africa last week, I gave a talk um, at the University of the Western Cape, and someone asked me the same question um, about food democracy in, in South Africa. Um, and I was talking, I, it was more of a research-oriented talk, but it had some, um, a, a couple of similarities. And, um, and I think it's a lot, uh, what a lot of people are, um, are thinking about. So, but what does that actually mean? When people have busy lives, people don't necessarily want to go to meetings. There's a brilliant uh, thing written by Mark Winnie about this, about how they invited a, a local woman along to represent the community to a, a, communi a, a meeting. And it was like, she had to come with her kids. She didn't have anyone to look after her kids. The kids were uh, distracted. They hadn't been in a room like that. They wanted to eat cookies. It was, it was a disaster. Um, you know, that, that, that kind of community representation didn't work in that particular instance because they hadn't actually taken into account the lifestyle of the person who they were inviting to represent the community. And, um, and so I think, it, again, it goes back uh, about going to the next question for the people that you interviewed and saying, well, if we're going to have more democracy, um, when have you, you know, what, what, what do you want, what decisions do you want to be influencing? And, and when can you influence, you know, what, what, what processes are you comfortable being part of? I think it's, it can be very intimidating for people who think they want to be part, who, who do rightly want to be part of processes, and then you put them in processes, and the processes are in places they find it difficult to go to, at times it's difficult to go to, the language you use is indecipherable uh, because they haven't been trained in that particular thing. So you need to build capacity uh, for those people to, to engage, um, and I think that's, I think that's, that's really important. But I certainly think um, that what you're saying is, is, is absolutely spot on. And we just need to have better structures in, in building capacity to, to do that and to be less expert and more handing over the expertise for the people in those communities. That's a very nice answer. 
Sharon's research is fabulous in terms of exactly what you were saying about listening to working class disenfranchised people. It's really great. <clears throat> Alvord Miranda from a uh, retired from the University of East London. Karina, has the thought occurred to you that the system that's rotten to the core is the capitalist system and that there may not be any solutions within that system? And that the various examples of solutions that are being offered by people from their ver various points of views are all examples of pre people trying to escape the operation of the capitalist system as a whole in their own little ways. And maybe what we need to look for is a ways of linking all those forms of escape into a more general form of struggle against the capitalist system as a whole. Because it is what you get all the time is you try and the idea of policy solutions actually militates very much against this idea because it's a top-down. You're trying to influence power, which itself is predetermined by the overall power structure, when what you need to do is develop the power from below rather than speak the truth to power. So in that respect, I think there may be a a contradiction between looking for policy solutions and looking for solutions. You know, I, I laugh because I've had this discussion with my husband many times. <laughs> this, is, this is a discussion she had in the <laughs> 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 who is a, uh, is Who is a, 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 um, a theorist on, on capitalism. Um, and, um, and, and we've had this argument where he'll say, you know, what are you doing all this policy? This is some time ago now. You know, what are you doing all this policy wonk stuff for? That doesn't really make the difference. Um, when I'm like, no, I'm, a happy, I'm happy being a policy wonk, thank you. Um, but then I challenge him and say, well, hang on a minute. Come on, what real solutions are you coming up with? You know, um, go and occupy or, or go and live in, um, you know, in little places in France when everyone's radical. And, you know, what, what does that really mean for the mainstream system? So, so but, but joking aside, I, I, it is something I've, I've, I've thought a lot about. And, um, and it is tough because the capitalist system is what it is and it's all-encompassing. But at the end of the day, I've come down on the side that lots and lots of actions can make a difference together. And, and that's not a very sophisticated answer. Um, but it is one that, that says it's OK to have gradual wonkish change. Um, but in my own thinking, that's been evolving. Um, I have been thinking more about these bottom-up approaches a lot more in the last couple of years. And I said it's a kind of self-critique, as it were. Uh, l let me just very briefly share with you an experience that I had uh, when I was living in New York. This is many years ago. And I was involved in community-based um, activities then, uh, research, but also engagement with various civil society organisations, which is a very, very important learning experience for me. And, and we'd gone out on the bus... Um, uh, with this group to, uh, to visit a, a community-supported agriculture farm up in upstate New York. And on the way back on the bus, this young woman uh, was... was um, I was talking to a young woman, uh, just graduated, and she'd been involved in community work. And I was sort of rave, raging on about how wonderful all these bottom-up approaches, community-based uh, action was. And she sort of looked at me and she said, yeah, she said, but we need to have a good policy framework in which to act. And, and then a few weeks later, I was off to WHO and I decided to take, to go and work at the global level as opposed to the community level. It was a decision that I made. And, and ever since then, I've, I've wrestled with this and I've always remembered what that young woman said to me on that bus, that, that to have these more, uh, to have action come up from the bottom, you need to have action at the top as well as a framework in which it can flourish. And I still believe that. Um, now, that's not going to take down capitalism, but I'm, I'm just someone who works with what we've got and, and is an advocate for, for many solutions tacking away um, at the same time um, while understanding. I think it is important. I, think, I don't understand why people graduate from high school without knowing what capitalism is. I think it's outrageous that, that people are not taught um, the basics of our economic system at school. Um. 
quick, quick question about, a, oh, sorry, um, Tim Waterman. I'm a, a, a researcher in taste, food ways, landscape, and democracy uh, at Riddle College in Essex. Um, and it's precisely the question about taste that I want to ask you, because you throughout referred to people's preferences, uh, which to me, when you're talking about people and how they operate in place, it feels like a sort of bloodless term. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, is it, do you use the term preference instead of taste because, because that's what people in power tend to listen to more? Or is that a term that comes from advertising, so it's more in the, in the common parlance? But why preference instead of taste? Yeah, no, well, I, I don't think they're quite the same. But let me tell you about why I, use, I started to use the term preferences, which I did a couple of years ago. And the reason is, is because um, I was trying to um, provide a counterpoint to some mainstream economic thinking. And mainstream economic thinking has a very clear model of food choice. If you read Food Policy Analysis by Peter Timmer, published in 1983, uh, it's very, set out very clearly. You have income, price, and preferences. Uh, and so the perspective that I was coming from was to say, what does the economist mean when they're talking about preferences? And then that led me back to looking at behavioral psychology's understanding of preferences and realizing that the term preferences was understood very differently by different disciplines, which is very common when you're doing interdisciplinary work, to find that the same word is understood very differently by different disciplines. And indeed, some understand it to mean taste. Um, what I'm understanding by it is if, I am, if, a, if, if, if someone puts five foods in front of me, which one would I choose? So in that, in that particular instance, what is my preference in that particular situation? So I don't see it the same as taste, but I am using it for political reasons in that sense, um, to try and, 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 and yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the reason. The camera can't see, but he's nodding. Hello, um, thank you, Karina. My name's Nora, and I work at the Wellcome Trust. Um, but these views are my own, so I'm not speaking on behalf of the Wellcome Trust. But I just wanted to share with you that we are working on a project at the moment, which is a national engagement project that's due to launch next year, and it's about exploring the connections between environment, nutrition, and health through the lens of the food system. And this is a very open initiative where very much wanting to work in collaboration with many, you know, people of all ages, with researchers, with farmers, with caterers, with chefs, so everyone within that system, which is everyone, because it is a universal system, and we're exploring how we link people's individual experiences of their local food systems then with the global situation, so how are your food choices, how are they impacting on people living around the world? Um, so this is an open invitation to you all. Um, I totally take on board people's views around investments, um, but I am a human working within a large organization. And at the end of the day, I've worked in the cultural sector for a number of years, and I've worked uh, due to the cuts in government funding. There is there's very limited money out there for people to do projects that connect arts practices with research. And uh, I have to say the reality of it is that there are some organisations that fund work in this area and I think we all need to come together um, and join forces on these major issues that face us all. Um, so please get in touch with us. Um, at the moment we're called the Food and Drink Initiative, um, but we're soon to have um, a better name than that. <laughs> um, and we have got a web page on the Welcome Trust website. So um, we will have an ambassador network. We're working in partnership with a number of other organisations and uh, please do get in touch with us um, because the ambassador network we're developing, we would like to bring together connecting people who work in research, people who community uh, projects, young people as well, importantly. I think we're really trying to look at ways of giving a voice to young people because it's their future we're talking about. You know, we talk about 2050 this, 2050 that, um, and actually that is their future. So trying to find a way of giving them a voice as well. And the communities that someone mentioned, you know, working with people who, for whatever reason, may feel disconnected from research or science, who are living in different, uh, with different, ch face different challenges around food, maybe living in food poverty. So it's trying to work with groups who have relationships with those individuals as well. So, um, yeah, just wanted to, these are my personal views. Um, so please, <laughs> just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. And thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Do you want to come in? No, I'm 
Sounds great. Can you hear me? Um, Ilva Johansson, I work for the Sustainable Restaurant Association. Um, so in all this food industry talk, I just wanted to see if you had a viewpoint on, in the future, if restaurants will also have some sort of policy in terms of what food they serve and produce. There's more and more people eating out, it's cheaper, it's more accessible, more and people live in cities. And so um, what I find part of the problem is healthy food available on restaurant menus and how that is advertised and sort of promoted and if restaurants should have healthy food available. And I just wonder if there's any research on this or if you think it's important in the food network. Yeah, well, just a very general answer. I mean, yes. Um, I think there's this assumption made by uh, restaurants and others that they're just selling the, people that, uh, the, the food that people want. Uh, whereas I think the, there's a huge role for the food environment generally, including restaurants and food service and vendors and street food, um, to uh, to um, to encourage um, the development of you know people learning to like um, healthy food. But I think that really starts with children. So one of the interesting things I think that the restaurant industry needs to look at um, is children's food menus. And I don't just mean healthy, putting healthy food on, like adding a vegetable. I mean to say, do we really need to have children's food menus? Or do we just need to have smaller portions of adult food? Um, because it kind of differentiates them as a market. You know, this is the children's food. And so it encourages children to think that they have their own food and it's different to what their parents or their caregivers are having. And which I think creates a kind of separation, uh, which is unnecessary. Um, so um, that's one thing that I think um, the restaurant industry really needs to, um, to look at. Very good. Last question. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Zarko. I run a social enterprise. I work with young people teaching them how to cook and how to eat. And I never use the word healthy in anything that I do because I think that's definitely a put on. But you talked about preference and something that people go up to to choose it and enjoy it. I was wondering if you think there's a different, a, a, an age where preferences are best made. I mean, people work well with young kids or older kids or maybe teenagers or maybe at some point you have your preferences already and, and that creates a general change. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question there. And I have looked in detail at the scientific um, literature available and worked with some behavioral psychologists in trying to figure this out. Um, and the evidence is clear that the taste uh, preferences begin in the first thousand days of life um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in utero, um, as it were, um, through um, you know, uh, the food that the, the mother is, is eating. Um, so um, it's really in understanding this literature that, that has made, in my own thinking, move earlier in the child's life. I'm a strong advocate of breastfeeding, uh, for breastfeeding for lots of reasons, but one is, it, is that it, it, helps, it helps the child understand variability, which is the problem with formula milk, is, is that it, it, they don't experience variability in, in taste. Um, but when you actually look at the evidence, um, the evidence is that there's a lot of learning that goes on at very, very young ages. But there isn't really any evidence to say that the learning stops. So you can always relearn your taste preferences, but that there is evidence that taste preferences will persist, will, will persist over time. So, but I, I've, I grilled my colleague, who's an expert on this, uh, Jane Wardle, um, who's a, a, one of the national experts on this, and, um, and she wasn't able to say, yes, you know, this is a period where there, it's more or less, um, because just, the scientific evidence hasn't been collected because it's kind of difficult to collect for a range of reasons. So I think what I concluded from that is that it starts in utero and it continues and it is intense among children, amongst young children, but preferences can always be relearned and changed. But there will come a point, um, you know, there is a, a point even for very young children when they will develop a preference and think that's, that's what it is that they like. And of course that will be reinforced if their environment stays stable. So all the work on habit formation uh, and, and auto-contextual cues and these kinds of things shows is that if the environment stays the same, it will just reinforce their preferences, whether that be in the home or outside the home. So that's why it's, it, it's critical to, um, 
um, to change that environment in order that the preferences um, can change. And this idea, and I've struggled with this as, as, a, as a parent of a, of a seven-year-old who was a very difficult eater. You know, I've had that personal experience of knowing it isn't just, oh, you know, let's put healthy food on the table. It's all work out. It's all so easy. You know, breastfeeding is all so easy. You know, it's not. It's, it's hard. It's a challenge. Maybe it is for some people, but for me it was hard and a challenge, and I think it is for a lot of people. And... Um, but, but what, what we really need is to empower parents and caregivers to be persistent um, in, in persistently providing the right kinds of foods that can contribute to a healthy diet because the evidence is very clear that that exposure will eventually lead to um, greater acceptance of that food.